Hello all, welcome to Forest Medity. So today in this video we are going to start human physiology chapter. So the first chapter is breathing and exchange of gases. So let's quickly get through this. So the process of exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with the carbon dioxide produced by the cells is called as breathing, which is also commonly known as respiration. So you have to know the respiratory organs of different uh, uh, class of animals. So the lower invertebrates like sponges, sealant reeds, flat forms exchange oxygen with CO2 by simple diffusion over their entire body surface. So earthworms use their moist cuticle and insects have a network of tubes to transport the atmospheric air within the body. Specialized, special vascularized structures called gills which is through branch branchial respirations are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks whereas vascularized bags called lungs which uh, is from pulmonary respiration are used by the terrestrial forms for the exchange of gases among vertebrates fishes use gills whereas amphibians reptiles birds and mammals respire through their lungs so amphibians like frog can also respire through their moist skin which is called as cutaneous res cutaneous respiration next moving on to the human respiratory system so this part is very much important a pair of external nostrils opening out above the upper lips is present this leads to a nasal chamber through a nasal passage then you will, then this will open into a pharynx which is a common passage for both foot and air again after the pharynx it is the larynx region then into the trachea so larynx is a cartilaginous box which helps in the sound production and hence it is also called as sound box during swallowing glottis can be covered by a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis so this is a very very important question so epiglottis is used to prevent the entry of food into the larynx Trachea is a straight tube extending up to the mid thoracic cavity which divides at the level of fifth thoracic vertebra into right and left primary bronchi. So it divides at fifth thoracic vertebra. So this is important and it is a most probable question also. So each bronchi undergoes repeated divisions to form the secondary and tertiary bronchi and bronchioles which end up to a very thin term, terminal bronchioles. So the trachea, primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi and the initial bronchioles are supported, are supported by an incomplete cartilaginous ring. So if you can see in this diagram, you have a ring-like structure. So each terminal bronchiole gives rise to a number of very thin, irregular vault and vascularized bag-like structures which is called as alveoli. So, uh, in a normal uh, respiratory system, human respiratory system, there are two lungs present which are covered by double layered pleura with pleural fluid between them. So the use of this uh, pleural fluid is to reduce the friction on the lung surface. The outer pleural membrane is in close contact with the thoracic lining whereas the inner pleural membrane is in contact with the lung surface. The part starting from the external nostrils till the terminal bronchiole is called as conducting part whereas the alveoli and the ducts form the respiratory or exchange part. So the uh, function of conducting part is to uh, transport the air to the alveoli, clear it from foreign particles, humidify it and bring the air to the body temperature. Whereas exchange part is the site where the actual diffusion of oxygen and CO2 between the blood and air takes place. Next moving on to the thoracic chamber. This is an airtight chamber. So you should know where it is formed. Uh, in which side of it so thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by vertebral column ventrally by sternum lateral ribs and lower side is the diaphragm so this is important dorsal vertebral column ventral sternum lateral ribs and lower side is diaphragm so respiration takes place in mainly in five steps that is breathing or pulmonary ventilation then diffusion of gases transport of gases diffusion of oxygen and CO2 and this utilization of oxygen by the cells for catabolic reactions and resultant release of the CO2. Mechanism of breathing. So breathing involves mainly two stages that is inspiration and expiration. Inspiration is the uh, process in which the atmospheric air is drawn in whereas expiration is the process in which alveolar air is released out. So in inspiration occurs when the pressure within the lungs that is called as intrapulmonary pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure and that is there is a negative pressure in the lungs with respect to the atmospheric pressure whereas expiration takes place when the intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. 
Inspiration is initiated by the contraction of diaphragm which increases the volume of thoracic chamber in the anterior posterior axis. That means it is um, pulling the all the air from the atmosphere. So the contraction of external intercostal muscles lift up the ribs and the sternum causing an increase in the volume of thoracic chamber in the dorsoventral axis. So the increase in thoracic volume causes an increase in pulmonary volume. So, increase in pulmonary volume causes decrease in the intrapulmonary pressure to less than the atmospheric pressure, which again forces the air from outside to move into the lungs, which is called as inspiration. So, only here the intrapulmonary pressure decreases, rest all things increases. Now, this leads to an increase in intrapulmonary uh, pressure to slightly above the atmospheric pressure causing the expulsion of air from the lungs that is called as uh, um, expiration. So in expiration what happens the thoracic volume is reduced and also the pulmonary volume and there is an increase in intrapulmonary pressure so they are inversely related. And human uh, breathes around 12 to 16 times per minute and this uh, can be estimated estimated using a device called a spirometer. Next moving on to the respiratory volume and capacity. There are different types and each PYQ if you previous year question paper if you open one question from this part is there in every uh, previous year. So this is a most 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 probable uh, topic. So tidal volume. Tidal volume is nothing but the volume of air inspired or expired during the normal respiration. This Values are important. It's 6,000 to 8,000 ml of air per minute. Then IRV that is inspiratory reserve volume. So additional volume of air a person can inspire by a forcible inspiration is called as IRV and this averages from 2,500 to 3,000. Expiratory reserve volume is nothing but the additional volume of air a person can expire by a forcible expiration. So this value is 1,000 to 1,100 ml. Next is the residual volume. Residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs even after a forcible expiration. So the average value is 1100 to 1200 ml. Next is the inspiratory capacity, expiratory capacity. So inspiratory capacity is total volume of air a person can inspire after a normal expiration. So this is TV plus IRV, TV plus IRV. So this formulas they may easily give the match the following or in a normal way also. Expiratory capacity is total volume of air a person can expire after a normal inspiration. So this is TV plus CRV. FRC functional residual capacity is volume of air that will remain in the lungs after a normal expiration which is ERV plus RV. Vital capacity is the maximum volume of air a person can breathe in after a forced expiration. So this is ERV plus TV plus IRV. TLC total lung capacity is complete total volume of air accommodated in the lungs at the end of forced inspiration. So this is RV, ERV plus TV and IERV or the vital capacity plus residual volume. This is because these three are already included in this. So you can tell vital capacity plus RV residual volume. Next, exchange of gases. Alveoli are the primary sites of exchange of gases. Oxygen and CO2 are exchange in this site by simple diffusion mainly based on the pressure concentration gradient. So the solubility of the gases as well as thickness of the membranes are involved in the diffusion and these are the two most important factors that can affect the rate of diffusion. So this is a most probable question. What are the two factors that is the solubility of gas and the thickness of membrane? Pressure contributed by an individual gas in a mixture of gas is called partial pressure and is represented as PO2 for oxygen, PCO2 for carbon dioxide. So this table is very important. Direct questions can come from here. So if you see from the atmospheric air till the tissue, uh, this is 159 here. Then in the alveolar it's 104. Blood in deoxygenated, you can oxygen will be always less. In oxygenated, oxygen will be more. Then in the tissues, it will be less. Same way CO2, in the air it will be less. Alveoli it's 40. In deoxygenated, it will be more. Oxygenated, it will be less. Tissues is 40. If you can see here, there is no value above 45 in the CO2 case. So this is an important diagram which you can learn it. And this is the explanation for this table actually. So you can go through the oxygenated, deoxygenated and the system here. 
Next, the solubility of CO2 is 20 to 25 times higher than that of oxygen. So this is also very, very important question. And the diffusion, if you can see this diagram, the diffusion membrane is made up of mainly three layers. That is thin squamous epithelium of alveoli, endothelium, endothelium of alveoli capillaries and the basement membrane. These are the three uh, layers. All the factors in our body are favorable for diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli to tissues and that of CO2 from tissues to alveoli. Next, transport of gases. So, this is a very, very important paragraph and many PYQs are there based on this and this is also a most probable question. So, 97% of oxygen is transported by RBC and the 3% is dissolved, uh, carried by plasma in a dissolved state. Now, coming on to CO2. 20 to 25% is transported by RBC, 70% is uh, carried as a bicarbonate ion and 7% of CO2 is dissolved in, uh, is carried through plasma in a dissolved state. So, these values are important. Next, transport of oxygen. So, hemoglobin is a red colored iron containing pigment which is present in the RBC. Oxygen can bind with the hemoglobin in a reversible manner to form oxyhemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry a maximum of four molecules of oxygen. This is the most probable question. So, if you see, this is the oxygen dissociation curve, which is in a sigmoid curve. So, it's obtained when the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is plotted against the PO2. And this curve is called as oxygen dissociation curve. So, if you see in the alveoli, where there is a high PO2, uh, in the alveoli, PO, uh, partial pressure of oxygen is high, CO, partial pressure of CO2 is low, H plus concentration is low and lower temperature. If you remember, how to remember this is high PO2, rest all are low and this favors the uh, uh, formation of oxyhemoglobin. Whereas in the tissue, PO2 is less, rest all are high. So this favors the dissociation of oxygen from the oxyhemoglobin. And this is a PYQ and most probable question. So every 100 ml of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 ml of oxygen to, to the tissues under normal physiological condition. And regarding that itself, I'll explain this also here. Every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood delivers approximately 4 ml of CO2. So here it is 4 ml of CO2. And here it is 5 ml of oxygen. Here in oxygenated blood and here it is in deoxygenated blood. Now moving on to the transport of carbon dioxide. So CO2 is carried by hemoglobin as carbaminal hemoglobin that is around 20 to 25 percent. When PCO2 is high and PO2 is lowest in tissues, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs. Whereas in the PC, when the PCO2 is low and PO2 is high in the alveoli, dissociation of CO2 from carbamino hemoglobin takes place that is co2 which is bound to the hemoglobin from the tissues is delivered to the alveoli at the alveoli so this is a important reaction so co2 and water in the presence of carbonic anhydrides will form h2co3 and uh, in the presence of again a carbonic anhydrides will form hco3 minus plus h plus this can also happen in the reverse direction at the tissue side where partial pressure of co2 is high due to the catabolism CO2 diffuses, uh, diffuses into blood and forms HCO3 and H+. At the alveolar site where the PCO2 is less, the reaction proceeds in the opposite direction leading to the formation of CO2 plus H2O. So, in the, uh, in the alveolar site, it uh, goes in the backward direction whereas in the tissue site, it goes in the forward direction. So, this I have already explained. Next, regulation of respiration. So, there is a specialized center present in the medulla region of the brain which is called as respiratory rhythm center and this is primarily responsible for this regulation. There is another center present in the pons region of the brain which is called as pneumotaxic center which can moderate the functions of the respiratory rhythm center. Neural signal from this center can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter the respiration rate. Receptors associated with the aortic arch and carotid artery also can recognize changes in the CO2 and H plus concentration and send necessary signals to the rhythm for remedial action. So this is not much important, but this portion is important. You should know which region is which, uh, what it is called. Disorders are very important in the human physiology chapter. Each and every chapter disorders, there will be questions in the NEET exam. So this is very important. Asthma, it is a difficulty in breathing which is caused due to wheezing. 
and this is mainly due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles emphysema this is asked around many times three three or more times they have asked this question so this is a most probable question this is caused due to cigarette smoking this is a chronic disorder in which the alveolar walls are damaged due to which the respiratory surfaces decrease next is the occupational respiratory disorder this is mainly uh, involved uh, this this disorder can be in people who mainly involved in grinding or stone breaking the long exposure can give rise to inflammation which leads to the fibrosis and thus causing a serious lung damage so this is about the breathing and exchange of chap uh, gases chapter so we'll meet you in the next video uh, please like share and subscribe so that you don't miss out any notification and thank you all